Okay. Do you hear me? I think you're muted. So, um, I apologize. Wait. No problem. I apologize. I just want to let you know that recording started as well. So I'm very happy to welcome Oswaldo Zavala here for the first of a, a series of talks that um, University of Washington Latin American and Caribbean Studies is organizing around drug wars and narco narratives. Um, I'm Vanessa Frigi. I'm an assistant professor in the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies, and I'll be moderating this event. Um, so. Oswaldo is going to give us a talk today entitled The Drug War Storytelling Machine, Narco Narratives, and National Security at the U.S. Border. And before introducing him more fully, I want to thank uh, the sponsors who made this event possible, um, the Calderwood Foundation, and as I mentioned, LAX at the University of Washington. Um, so just a bit about format, we'll begin with our speaker and then uh, who will give a, a talk and then we'll open it up to the Q&A. Um, and because this is a webinar format, you'll put your questions in the <laughs> box below. Um, and we will try, I will try to moderate those and, and present those to Oswaldo for, for him to answer. So please uh, ask, ask questions. Um, obviously one downside of the webinar is we can't have as much interaction, but um, we wanna get to as many questions that the, the audience might have as possible. So without further ado, I will introduce our speaker. Oswaldo Zavala is professor of contemporary Latin American literature and culture at the College of Staten Island and at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He's the author of many books, um, most recently La Guerra en las Palabras, Una Historia Intelectual del Narco en México, which was published in Mexico and hopefully will be translated and, and published in the US like his recent book, um, The Cartels Do Not Exist. He has also published more than 50 articles on contemporary Latin American narrative, the US-Mexican border, and the link between violence, culture, and late capitalism. And one of these articles won the 2015 Humanities Essay Award from the Latin American Studies Association Mexico section. Um, and he began his career as a journalist in Ciudad Juarez. Um, and I hope if we have time that I'll be able to ask him some questions about that as well. So without further ado, um, Oswaldo, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Vanessa. It's so, so much a pleasure to be here and to um, have a, this virtual conversation with, with you and your colleagues and students. Um, as you mentioned, I, I am presenting today a little bit on, on my uh, most uh, recent uh, research, in particular, my last two books on drug trafficking. I'm going to share a screen for um, a PowerPoint presentation and um, I'll, hopefully I will not uh, make a mess uh, uh, with the technology here. Hold on one second. Um, let's see. Okay. And all right. I assume everybody can see the, the screen. Is that correct? Um, my, yes, we can see right. it. Perfect. All right. Excellent. So I'm going to start reading from a different screen because I couldn't place both of them at the same time. So I'm sorry if my... Um, um, my, uh, my face is going to be looking at the second screen here. <laughs> All right, so um, I'll start reading. On June 20th, uh, 2018, during a reading presentation of my book, Drug Cartels Do Not Exist, a rather ironic situation arose via WhatsApp that I thought uh, I could use as an introduction to this conversation. This message announcing a total cleansing of the territory warned that anyone after 11 p.m. that uh, could be seen walking in motorcycles, uh, in cars, SUVs, with or without tinted windows, I'm quoting from the message, will be kidnapped and tortured until they talk or die. That's what the message said, and, I, and you can read a little bit of, of that in the, in the slide here. The, the sinister message was signed by the so-called Antrax Corporation and new people, along with someone named Compa Pollo, which in English could be translated some, somehow as uh, chicken bro or perhaps chicken dude. They claim to be working for the drug lords Joaquin El Chapo Guzman Loera, the alleged boss of the Sinaloa cartel, as you know, um, and his children, but also with Rafael Caro Quintero, the notorious trafficker um, of the Guadalajara cartel convicted in 1985 for the, DEA, for the murder of DEA agent Enrique Camarena, but released 
from prison in 2013, only to be placed in the FBI's most wanted list, offering an unprecedented $20 million reward for information leading to his recapture. And that night, uh, they promised to rid the border city of traffickers from rival organizations of the Zetas, the Gulf Cartel, and the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. At the same time, uh, at that time, I'm sorry, it was unclear which criminal organization was supposed to be in control of the city since in 2016, the Chihuahua state attorney told the media that Caro Quintero, seen here in the, in, in the most wanted um, notice here, uh, was in fact planning to attack the Sinaloa cartel to take over the Juarez Plaza, as you know, one of the country's major drug trafficking headquarters. But that summer night, uh, as I was doing the reading in 2018, and according to the WhatsApp message, Caro Quintero had formed an alliance with the Sinaloa cartel to take Juarez from cartels that no one knew were supposed to be ruling the border. And while I was recording, uh, recalling this, this incident, I quickly stumbled upon a rather curious fact. The same message reappeared in social media a few days later. Uh, on June 2016, uh, 26, I'm sorry, but also two years earlier on April 20th of 2016. But then the threatening, uh, then in that message, threatening various towns in Chihuahua state with the difference that Chicken Bro, right, this, this guy, Compa Pollo, did not sign it. And then it resurfed again on October 11th, 2016 in the states of Coahuila and Nuevo Leon, as you can see in, in this slide. And then the next day, the very next day, in a small town of the state of Guanajuato. But this time, the local news site that, I, that you can see here uh, produced um, uh, notice that the same message, in fact, circulated with my minor variants at least since 2014 in numerous other states of the country, Michoacán, San Luis Potosí, Puebla, and Nayarit. I remember uh, that the message initially made me feel very uneasy when I was presenting my book, but it was quickly dismissed by, by all my friends, uh, reporters with decades of experience as an absurd hoax. By the end of 2018, an academic article that, uh, that you can see here on the screen was already studying the fictitious nature of such messages in, all, uh, in different cities in Northern Mexico. And I'm quoting from, from this article, ambiguity, anonymity and indeterminacy allow panic rumors to be successful messages in terms of their proliferation and acceptance. And, and the author, as you can see, is, um, is a colleague from the, the Escuela de Antropología uh, e Historia del Norte de México. Um, preface by, by this anecdote, uh, uh, for this presentation, I would like to advance two complementary claims as I attempt to explain the link between drug trafficking, language, and culture. First, that, the, uh, that Mexico's history of drug trafficking is not equivalent to the history of the, uh, of the US-Mexico war on drugs. The latter did not begin in, two, in 2006 with President Felipe Calderón's anti-narcotics militarization. Neither it did with President Richard Nixon's 1971 infamous declaration of drug abuse, quote, as public, number one, public enemy number one in the United States, for which President Nixon unleashed a worldwide offensive dealing with problems of sources of supply. Its unexpected origin, in my opinion, is in the 1947 National Security Act of the US Congress. That law inaugurated the national security paradigm that became the geopolitical platform and the ideological foundation of decades of a transnational militarist interventionism built around changing enemies of which the narco is just another of its iterations. After the worldwide fight against global communism and along the war against terrorism, and even more recently, the violent and inhuman anti-immigrant uh, policies of the hemisphere. It is therefore crucial to study the official language crafting the narco as a discourse, uh, as a discursive object produced by the national security platform and not the traffickers themselves, for the most part, unable to articulate their own narrative, incapable of intervening in the hegemonic discourse surrounding them, 
conditioning their acts, defining a horizon of expectations in which they have been placed. The WhatsApp message circulating in Ciudad Juarez that night was in an effect of a discourse performing a violence, a symbolic violence similar to the so-called narcomantas, one of which you can see here in the slide, uh, or improvised banners uh, attributed to traffickers. When these messages uh, frame actual episodes of gruesome violence, they impose the same narrative of narcos as the primary source, the ultimate justification for the permanent militarization of the territory. It is through the storytelling machine that the foundational terms of the narco discursive field first emerged, as I argue in my new book, La Guerra en las Palabras, or maybe perhaps as a translation, War Within Words. The concept of cartel, for example, was drawn from the field of economics to artificially conceive of a criminal alliance between drug traffickers and producers. It was introduced by the DEA in the late 1970s and some of the Mexican traffickers first included in such label, um, those from the so-called Guadalajara cartel in the 1980s, learn of, it, of it, if, <laughs> learn of its existence at the end of their criminal careers when they were already in prison, as Caro Quintero said uh, in this interview. The idea of a Mexican padrino or godfather is of course based on Mario Puzo's famous novel and Francis Ford Coppola film, film trilogy, but the concept was originally coined by Puzo and had no real models. There never was a real godfather, neither in the US nor in Mexico, but in 1983, the DA labeled Mexican trafficker Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo as the first godfather. And in, in, in the media ever since, as you can see, uh, well, actually I'm shifting from a different slide, but anyway, um, in the media, uh, it repeats this fiction even today uh, as the DEA recycles uh, the same concept. So in this slide, you can see one of the uh, um, uh, documents recalling the, the first Operation Godfather, right? Operation Padrino from 1983. And then if you flash forward to 2018, um, the same term was used to label not a trafficker, but uh, the former uh, Secretary of Defense in Mexico that was detained in the US. Likewise, we have all heard the fictitious Pablo Escobar from uh, the Netflix series Narcos threatening soldiers and police agents with the offer silver or lead with, with that affected Colombian accent poorly simulated by Brazilian actor Wagner Moura. But the expression plata o plomo, silver or lead, originally attributed to Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz was in fact first introduced by the DEA in an unverifiable anecdote in which Caro Quintero threatens a fearful federal police in his own office almost, um, I'm sorry, um, almost as in another episode of the Netflix series. Even the expression uh, boss of bosses, popular among New York mafia families was first linked with Mexican traffickers again by the DEA. And later in a popular folk song recorded by the Norteño band, very popular band, Los Tigres del Norte, that has been recycled so many times that virtually all Mexican drug lords have been at some point boss of bosses or jefe de jefes, as, as you can um, read from uh, this article written by a Mexican journalist um, going through all the extensive catalog of traffickers that at some point had fit the label. Scholar Maria Jose Rodriguez Rejas has argued that the national security paradigm was, a, was grad, gradually exported to Latin America through a far reaching political process orchestrated in, me, in mechanism of, uh, mechanisms of international cooperation, high level intergovernment meetings, and the constant work of diplomacy in what is known as the US hemis hemispheric project. It incorporates the totality of the US agenda in the region with particular attention to natural resources and geoeconomic expansion. After the 1989 polemic Washington consensus that established, as we know, a neoliberal program for Latin American governance, there were 12 security and defense agreements signed during the following decade. Rodriguez Rejas explains that with this hemispheric project, the concept of the enemy, and I'm quoting here, the fight against terror 
terrorism and drugs, the definition of inter internal controls, total and preventive war, and the intervention in, in cases of failed states are all part of the guidelines and, and strategies that the U.S. imposes on disputed territories, end quote. During these decades, Mexican society adopted the narrative that elevated organized crime and placed it at the center of a permanent threat of national security. The imagined narco reproduced common prejudice against ranchers from the north of Mexico who supposedly raised above their station by accumulating unsurpassed criminal power and influence. But there is a fundamental contradiction in the hegemonic narrative that is so often overlooked. On one hand, uh, we are told that me by Mexican and US authorities that drug cartels are, uh, are led by sophisticated criminals who are not only borderline psychopaths, but who are also cutting edge financial experts controlling a global business that demands intricate money laundering operations, offshore accounts, uh, and shell companies that move millions of dollars on a daily basis. On the other hand, the same mastermind traffickers are imagined as simple-minded characters from the poorest regions of Mexico, as represented in this mannequin uh, that, that comes from the permanent collection of Mexico's Museum of Drugs, um, an institution uh, created by uh, the National Defense Ministry, and that it is close to the public, but open for soldiers training in how to identify narcos. The traffickers are attributed in, uh, from this vision, vision uh, a pre-modern sense of family and honor drawn perhaps from the early modern Spanish tradition of the picaresque, a primitive masculinity, a limitless sexual appetite and an elemental death drive that is only matched in this narrative by their desire for epic celebrity. This imagination constructed a powerful mythology that has permeated in all fields of cultural production in the US and Mexico, the same narco, uh, became the protagonist of countless films, novels, short stories, poems, TV series, hip hop songs, and folk ballads, and even some of the most sophisticated conceptual art. In some, from the 1970s and on, this narco became the central signifier in our understanding of organized crime and violence. And as I have studied elsewhere, narco culture, or what we think of narco culture, became thus the expression of the hegemonic narrative of national security. Less than a reflection of the real of the drug trade, narco culture has complemented the historical appearance of the global language of the drug trade as an object of the national security agenda. It is in this point that I would like to reconsider John Baudrillard's uh, concept of the desert of the real, uh, referring to Jorge Luis Borges' uh, on exactitude of science, as we know, uh, the celebrated short fable about a map of an empire so exact in size that it covered the entire territory, Baudrillard points to an era of simulation in modern society in which uh, there is, and I quote, a question of substituting signs of the real for the real. That is to say, an operation of deterring every real process via its operational double, a programmatic, metastable, perfectly descriptive machine that offers all the signs of the real and short circuits all its vicissitudes. Never again will the real have the chance to produce itself." End quote. This is what Baudrillard uh, argues. And if the real is no longer able to produce itself, the simulation of the real of organized crime found in its recurrent hegemonic form, uh, found its recurrent hegemonic form in the face of a narco. Sometimes literally as in this piece uh, from the permanent collection of the DEA museum in Arlington, Virginia, by, which by the way, reopened its doors very recently after being uh, completely remodeled. Since you will have the opportunity to discuss uh, such topics with one of its producers, let us briefly consider to illustrate this point and the general strategies of representation of national security, the Netflix series Narcos as an eloquent product of the neoliberal era. The first minutes uh, for all of you who, who have seen it uh, and you will recall uh, of the first episode in the first season represent the beginning of the era of 
securitarism for the hemisphere. It is pre precisely dated in 1989 when global communism was about to fade in history and as the relentless enemy of capitalism and as the war on drugs became the new national security doctrine under President Reagan, as argued in this brilliant essay, which, uh, published the same, which was published the same year of 1989. In the initial scene of Narcos, CIA and DEA agents uh, are seeing it's dropping uh, the phone conversations of known traffickers flying drones over the city of Bogota in Colombia. Manipulating privileged information obtained from illegal espionage, they push a, a special unit of the Colombian National Police to kill a drug trafficker named Poison, uh, also in English in the original. And, and this is a nickname, of course, that resonates with the popular televised campaign of just say no to drugs of the Reagan presidency that often warned of how US society um, uh, of how U.S. society was being poisoned by Latin American uh, traffickers. It is extremely telling the fact that the violence is triggered by U.S. information and then executed by Colombia, uh, Colombian official forces, a method that would be used frequently during the bloodiest years of the Mexican drug wars. It is perhaps the only honest aspect of the series that all six seasons are told from the perspective of DEA agents, since it is in fact more than the story of drug traffickers, the chronicle of how the US managed to set in motion its new national security doctrine in Latin America. On the opposite side, um, uh, traffickers like uh, the Colombian Pablo Escobar, as I mentioned before, played by Brazilian actor Wagner Moura, or uh, the Mexican uh, trafficker Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, played by Diego Luna, embody a quasi-ontological evil drawing from predictable cliches attributed to most narcos, uh, for example, the famous dictum that I already mentioned, Silver Oled. And if the series were told, however, from a Colombian or Mexican perspective, a very different story would have been enunciated. Uh, as political scientist Nancy Ricciani argued, the Colombian milita military had a historically comfortable relationship with local traffickers since they did not quote, constitute a threat to the social order as in the case with the guerrilla groups, end quote. Or uh, on the Mexican side, where traffickers work subordinated to political power and in a functional state of exception that did not, quote, dispute political power nor the direction of the state, as sociologist Luis Astorga has analyzed. For US national security interests, however, this de facto official instrumentalization of drug organizations was more of an obstacle than a resource by the late 1980s. The merciless brutality of the criminal groups is magnified, but as a product of global capitalism in the age of national security. And the series cannot help but portray the pressure that US diplomacy and intelligence agencies aimed at the Colombian and Mexican governments to adopt a hostile stance by declaring Escobar and Felix Gallardo as absolute enemies of their nations. In this sense, the series Narcos, in my opinion, is betrayed by its political unconscious and becomes a map of national security strategies in Latin America. As we know, the agents constantly provides, uh, provide consulting services for these cultural products, in fact, imposing a tight propaganda control in countless films and TV series, including, of course, Narcos, to the point that they even offer spoilers. Agent uh, J James Kirkendall, to the right in this photo next to the actor who played his role in Narcos, has said that he was especially anxious, and I'm quoting here, that they portray DEA agents in a respectful manner. But then later, his name was implicated along with a CIA agent in the 1985 murder of DEA uh, agent Enrique Camarena in Guadalajara, as you know, one of the central plots of Narcos Mexico, the, the, the second uh, uh, series under, under this name. Aside from all this, the anachronism of seeing the traffickers calling their organizations cartels in the series is symbolically true, at least from the perspective of the DEA. They are the ones narrating their imagined enemy from the rules of enunciation set forth by the US hegemonic power. It also matters very little 
that the two lead characters of the Colombian Narcos are played by a Brazilian and a Mexican actor. Um, it is also, as it also happens in film, uh, with actors such as Puerto Rican Benicio del Toro, who, as you know, has played the role of Mexican trafficker Rafael Caro Quintero in one of the earlier uh, versions of this, uh, of this uh, uh, series. A Mexican police from the uh, city of Tijuana in the film Traffic, and even Pablo Escobar himself uh, in this uh, recent movie. Del Toro has said uh, that the role of Escobar is in fact what he calls the Latin American Hamlet for any aspiring uh, self-respecting Latino actor. <laughs> and, and the history uh, of global securitarism then is better expressed with an all-star Latino cast that reminds us that after all, a narco may come from any Latin American country. As the national security simulation unfolds, we know well the lesson taught by Baudrillard, the real can no longer produce itself. In sum, the idea of drug trafficking in Latin America is histor historically inaccurate, but discursively real. Within the short memory span of our creative class mediated by the hegemonic logic of national security introduced in Mexico as in Colombia in the late 80s, this fact has little relevance. Narcos portrays the traffickers as powerful criminals who defy the governing class, the police and the armed forces in Mexico as in Colombia, but who are at the same time contradictorily jailed or assassinated. And this is how with the series, Netflix joins the field of cultural productions profiting from variations of the same narrative in countless novels, songs, films, TV series and conceptual art about the drug trade. Less than the result of a, cult, uh, a local cultural practice, narco culture is a discursive construct resulting from geopolitical mediation opportunistically exploited by the global um, uh, cultural market. By the first decade of the 21st century, however, that paradigm was fissured in the fields of cultural production that resisted the facile re reification of the narco imaginary calling into question the very viability of narco culture as a concept. Perhaps because of its collective nature, the film industry was among the first uh, uh, in, within this uh, cultural products to break away with the official discourse of drug trafficking. Scholars such as Ignacio Sanchez Prado and Ryan Rashot have analyzed uh, the relevance of Mexican films about the drug trade as they reformulate Hollywood dominated uh, genres intersecting with the region's convulsive history. But films such as Salvando al Soldado Perez, Miss Bala and Eli uh, brought critical insights to the drug war narrative that most cultural objects have failed to observe. Of these three films, Salvando al Soldado Perez or in English, Saving Private Perez <laughs> is perhaps the most effective in its critique of official discourse. Uh, the story centers uh, around Julian Perez, uh, played by actor Miguel Rodarte, a drug trafficker who promises his dying mother to rescue his brother, as, uh, who, who is a soldier with the US Army, missing in Iraq at the height of the post 9-11 war. Uh, Julian brings together a laughable but oddly skillful uh, team of traffickers who in a parody of James Bond or uh, Mission Impossible films, uh, travels to Iraq and successfully retreats the soldier comically overpowering the Iraqi militias and the failing US invasion. Um, and it is true as uh, Ignacio Sanchez Prado argues uh, that the film caricatures drug dealings by portraying such uh, characters as incompetent, ignorant and ruthless. Nevertheless, this caricature in the film um, is not original to the script, but it is rather the fateful appropriation of official discourse. The film takes the idea of cartels of powerful transnational organizations at face value, simply imagining how Mexican narcos could ultimately prevail over the Iraqi armed conflict with autochthonous ingenuity, uh, unlimited weapons and money, and the criminal experience that the Mexican and the US authority attribute to them. Oh, um, I wanted to play a little bit of the, um, 
of the um, uh, trailer so you can get a sense of, uh, of this film. And, and let me see if, I, if it works. I don't know if the sound is coming through. I hope so. Let's see. Uh, We're not getting sound on oh. our end. Okay, let me see what I, I think I need to share it again. And then uh, I think I didn't, yeah, I didn't share sound. Okay, hold on one second. Uh, here it comes again, all right. This time it is working, right? Okay. In a country where family is everything, Mexico's sexiest cartel boss will risk it all to embark on an impossibly epic suicidal journey into an unknown land known to many as Iraq. Ay, ch está Irak. Ay, por favor, Carmelo, si todo el mundo sabe dónde está Irak. Está al ladito de Kuwait y de Arabia Saudita, de España, de Holanda y todo eso, hombre. Además, vamos a llevar mapas. Ahí les va. Voy a necesitar cambiarme en un pequeño grupo de hombres. No me importa quiénes sean ni de dónde los tengan que sacar. Es el peor momento para intentar algo así, asumiendo que tu hermano siga vivo. ¿Cuál está vivo, Ladia? Your brother came to my land as an enemy, and as an enemy, he has to pay for that. ¿Y qué? ¿Te arrepientes de lo que hiciste? No. Miguel Rodarte, Jesus Ochoa, Joe Kinkozillo, Gerardo Tarasena, Rodrigo Oviedo, Jamie Camille, Marius Piguet, and Ada Ramones. We have a little, little problem. Saving Private Paris. In theaters. So then... Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have actually uh, stopped sharing the screen for one second. Um, the second. All right. Um, so it is. It is fascinating, of course, to see uh, how the different aspects of the national security narratives are conflated in this film. Right. For one side, you know, terrorism, uh, the Iraqi War, 9/11, uh, and of course uh, the drug wars in Mexico, and and how these two enemies uh, from the imagination of, of the national security paradigm actually brought into the same uh, scenario, right? The, the, the same uh, stage to, uh, to play the war fantasies of, uh, of this narrative. Um, and on the other hand, you know, literary works have been uh, a lot slower to incorporate such critiques. Uh, the 2000s uh, were dominated in Mexico by predictable narco novels, such as Elmer Mendoza's uh, Silver Bullets or Juan Pablo Villalobos Down the Rabbit Hole in which violent narcos exuding testosterone are at the center of Mexico's damaged civil society. There are singular novels uh, such as Roberto Bolaño's 2666 or Victor Hugo Rascón Banda's Contraband and Daniel Sada's The Language of the Game that shed light on criminal excesses of the army and the police in the war against drugs. But there's one novel that I wanted to discuss with you by Sinaloan author Cesar Lopez Cuadras, this novel uh, Cuatro Muertos por Capítulo, or Four Cadavers per Chapter, which was published in 2013. Uh, it stands alone as it embarks on a decisive deconstruction of the official narrative. Uh, a unique moment in this book, overlooked by most uh, literary scholars, summarizes its extraordinary textual strategy. The protagonist, the son of a humble peasant family that becomes the head of his own drug organization, discovers from a newspaper story that his criminal profile has become larger than life and that he is now allegedly and without his knowledge, the boss of a drug cartel. The idea seems rather attractive and he thinks in the novel, well, yes, a cartel, the newspapers say, that's what I'm going to build. And I would like to recall this scene to anyone inquiring about Lopez Cuadra's uh, fiction for two reasons. First, it is a clever intertextual tech, uh, take on one of Don Quixote's major modern achievements, right? When, when the old demented self-proclaimed uh, knight gets to read and criticize the first part of Cervantes's famous novel after someone hands him a copy of the book in the second part. 
uh, that, as you know, was published 10 years apart. And then secondly, more important, uh, this is a truly fascinating point in Mexican fiction because this novel, Cuatro Muertos, short circuits the decades old mythology about drug trafficking in Latin America. The kingpin is the last one to find out uh, that out there in the world dominated by mass media and sadly fake news, there is already a myth elevating his family to the rankings of the powerful cartel. This happens, by the way, towards the end of the novel. And in the following pages, in fact, the protagonist dies. I'm sorry for, um, for the spoiler. Um, the other uh, character, uh, uh, important, uh, uh, important aspect of this novel, uh, Cuatro Muertos, is the character Pancho Caldera. Uh, he's a former driver of the narco family who profits from his experience to help and hopefully seduce a young American woman researching the lives of Mexican traffickers uh, in order to complete a film script. Uh, and as Pancho exaggerates his memories to capture the young gringa's attention, he also corrects the mythical narratives of narcos and observes how old uh, traffickers are always subdued by official power. Um, but aside from these uh, rare interruptions, the history of the hegemonic discourse uh, articulated by US national security, by the US national security agenda still dominates in, a collective, in our collective imaginary about the drug trade. It is true that the disappearance of 43 students from the Ayotzinapa teachers uh, school in the state of Guerrero on September 26, 2014, triggered a national debate on the question of state violence that politicized the national security machine. Uh, scholars Fernando Escalante Gonzalvo and Julian Conseca, Canseco Ibarra have both studied how this event was extricated from the perverse narrative of the war on drugs against the numerous atrocities committed in Mexico that became since 2006 almost a question of routine, scarcely significant. But when the hegemonic narrative triumphs, which is almost always, the cultural fields of production search in new objects, more variations of the same enemy of a thousand faces. This explains in part the, vis the visibility of some of the most recent works of fiction and nonfiction about Mexico's wave of violence attributed to organized crime and its storytelling criminalizing poverty, the marginal and precarious lives of the Northern and Southern borders. And sometimes in the imagined body of the trafficker, the gang member, the criminalized migrant, the corrupt and complicit government official and the general political and moral decay of a country in, imagined in a permanent crisis of national security. It is in, the, in novels such as Janine Cummings, uh, American Dirt, or Don Winslow, The Cartel, or nonfiction by journalists such as Ian Grillo's uh, Blood Gun Money, How, American Arm, Arms, How America Arms Gangs uh, and Cartels, or Alan Fuhrer's El Jefe, The Stalking of El Chapo Guzman, um, based on investigation, this last one book uh, on, on the capture the, uh, and the trial of El Chapo, which reflect the constant reiteration of the same narrative in mainstream media reports, legitimizing the shared US-Mexico national security agenda. I have argued today uh, that the central problem posed by narco-narratives uh, nar narco narratives is that they emanate from the generalized perception that Mexico is affected by a permanent crisis of national security. Such has been the language of war, or more precisely, the presence of war within language. Following other journalists, uh, Down Payne Lee's uh, ground book, uh, ground book, groundbreaking book, uh, Drug War Capitalism, um, we have come to understand that the violence attributed to drug traffickers was little more than the accompanying narrative of an era of capitalist transformation that since the end of the 1980s began turning entire cities into deadly conflict zones. With explicit support of the US government, Mexico's anti-drug policies have failed to diminish the drug trade or any of the violence linked to it. Instead, those policies have been instrumental in establishing the military occupations of various regions and cities in the country with specific political and economic interests in mind. Doubtless, there are many factors explaining the multiple forms of violence in those cities and regions in Mexico with raising poverty rates and failing institutions. And clearly, drug organizations are responsible for a share of the killing. But Mexico's drug war can be more accurately described as the public name of the brutal strategy of a militarized state 
exercising violence against the poor while facilitating transnational interests that coincide with the privatization of the country's national resources. Multinational energy projects were on the rise in those years, exploiting uh, Mexico's rich oil, gas, uh, mining, and water reserves. And as uh, Dom Paley argues, uh, in addition to boosting US banks, propping, uh, uh, prop up, propping up political campaigns and feeding a profitable trade in arms, the imposition of drug war policies can benefit transnational oil and gas and mining companies, as well as other large corporations. There are other sectors that also enjoy benefits from the violence, the manufacturing and transportation industries, as well as a segment of the retail and commercial sector, uh, specifically those represented by corporate players like Walmart uh, and real estate interests in, part, uh, in parts of Mexico and the United States. The drug war, and this is of course uh, the quote from uh, Don Paley's book, is a long-term fix to capitalism's woes, combining terror with policymaking in a seasoned neoliberal mix, cracking open uh, social worlds and territories once unavailable to global um, capitalism. In this horrific context, the hegemonic narrative of national security persists today only because it is anchored, as I have argued today, on a symbolic structure that can be easily modified since it operates as a form without a fixed context. And I would like to finish off with a, a, a final uh, reflection on how exactly this narrative is transformed. As Donald Trump recently bragged with his base in a political rally that you perhaps all recall, President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador ordered thousands of troops of the newly created National Guard to the Mexican borders north and south to curb the increasing wave of undocumented migrants from Central America expected to rise um, around 700,000 in 2019 and ever since increasing. This shocking uh, new militarization includes the illegal detention of migrants on the northern, on the northern border, uh, de facto operating as a virtual wall for the aggressive anti-immigrant policy pushed by Trump from the beginning of his presidency in 2016. In other words, AMLO, has, uh, the president of Mexico, has accepted to use the new Mexican security force to undertake what could potentially become an extension of Trump's and now President Joe Biden's permanent campaign against migrants, often criminalized as traffickers, rapists, and even terrorists with little evidence to support those claims. It is telling that on June 14th, 2019, a week after a binational agreement to increase anti-immigrant militarization efforts south of the Rio Grande, the president of Mexico accepted the resignation of the Mexican head of the National Institute of Migration, a man named Tonatiu Guillén, who had led the federal government's initial strategy of encouraging the human right to migrate to put in his place a general um, and, and a former military um, uh, official uh, promoting instead the toughening of the federal government strategy to stop migration and comply with its commitment to US President Donald Trump. This new enemy Im uh, immigration the immigrant offers the synthesis of the history of national security agenda by combining in a single persona, the illegal, the undocumented uh, migrant, the narco, and now also the terrorist. Colombian journalist uh, Germán Castro Caicedo, one of the most relevant voices against uh, the anti-drug militarization of his country, famously described US intervention in the region as our foreign war, in which, and I'm quoting, the interest that, and the geopolitics that determine it are neither ours. As we face a new era of militarization beyond this drug war, we are witnessing the continuity of a foreign war on Mexican soil. The US and Mexico's intellectual class are once again put to the task of observing this new reality. Will we question those who work from official institutions to ignite a new armed conflict? Have we learned uh, the lessons brought about narco culture? Will we see past the articulation of this new national security myths uh, and seek those responsible for the continuation of war? we are yet to test the limits of our critical imagination. And 
as we all laughed uh, at the unexpected irony uh, back when I, when I was presenting my book in 2018 of having a WhatsApp threat coinciding with the presentation of my book, Drug Cartels Do Not Exist. And, um, and by the way, you should know it is coming out in, in translation soon. Uh, if you forgive this shameless moment of uh, self-promotion by showing here the, the, the cover. Um, and that night, as I saw how life in Juarez continued with no further mention of the Sinaloa cartel, the ridiculous sicarios and their messages lacking in creativity as much as in basic orthography, we stayed up late sharing drinks and stories with other border people in a crowded bar with live music, enjoying each other's company, looking to the future way past this narrative of a cartel about to strike. And instead we focus on our collective life and our shared future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Osvaldo. You've given us so much to think about. And um, there are quite a few questions coming in in the Q&A, which I'll direct to you. But um, as the moderator, I will uh, assert my ability to ask the first question. <laughs> sure. Um, and I'm interested in hearing a little bit about the reception and specifically about the reception in um, the US versus Mexico. And I know you mentioned your, because I know your book, uh, Los Carteles No Existen, has generated a lot of discussion and interest. It's been covered to some extent in the US press even before it was translated, because obviously, as you mentioned, it's not yet available. Um, but it's largely only been available to speakers and readers of Spanish, right? Um, so I'm just interested in, in knowing if you've seen a difference in terms of reception on the US side and Mexico. Um, and if you did, if that kind of challenged what you expected to see or if it confirmed it in some way. It's been, um, it's been quite unexpected, you know, for uh, at the beginning, when I first published the book, I, I thought that I would be welcome with just indifference or, or just you know, wholesome silence. <laughs> um, but instead, as you mentioned, it, it, it received, uh, um, you know, quite an accolade. And, and there was, of course, a, a debate about it. But uh, for the most part, I, I received very positive feedback. My, m m the, the way I, I interpret that is, is perhaps that we are traversing in Mexico a point of exhaustion uh, with, uh, with the official discourse you know, in which you know, we're so saturated by this, with the constant reiteration of this narrative in, in not only in, in film or, or uh, in TV series, but virtually in all places of cultural production. Uh, and of course, in official discourse, right? Um, and, and, and when the book came out in, in 2018, um, we also had already gone through, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, the Ajotzinapa case, right, in which, you know, nationally, um, uh, there was a collective uh, uproar for the disappearance of the students and, and uh, refocusing on, on, on state violence, which had been effectively uh, uh, depoliticized throughout the, uh, the presidency of Felipe Calderón, in which most violence, of course, was attributed to traffickers. Um, on the U.S. side, I believe uh, there is still uh, to, to a certain degree uh, uh, a type of resistance to, to this critique for several reasons. Uh, first, because you know, the, as, as I try to argue in my, in my presentation, the US is, is the generator of most of this mythology and it has effectively dominated uh, uh, in mainstream media, right? And in the dissemination of this discourse, right? Um, and, and it's so effective that, you know, as I try to also um, uh, research through my last book, uh, some of these narratives uh, that began early in the 1970s or 1980s are still with us today, right? And, and they're repeated and defended by um, contemporary official actors, right? By, by people in, in, in the, at the DEA, by people at the Department uh, of Justice. And even though uh, there seems to be also an opening to rethink the history of the drug trade, I believe there's still uh, the convention that um, in order to really understand what goes on in Mexico, once one has to focus on the history of traffickers on one side and also the effect that they have in corrupting uh, the spheres of government in Mexico. Uh, uh, and, and by doing so, of course, we erase completely the shared um, platform of national security that is pushing that very same narrative, right? Um, however, you know, I, I, I hope that, uh, that this is gradually changing. I, I believe that there are more uh, colleagues uh, working in very similar 
um, directions that that I am, and um, and this is I think an ongoing discussion that I that I also believe is is hopefully uh, mediating in, in in people who consume these products in the U.S. Right, uh, because I, I also believe that there's some some to to a, to a, to a certain degree a, a, an exhaustion experience by the consumers of, of theories and films and, and songs about uh, the drug trade. Absolutely, and that's super interesting. And I think um, that kind of leads into a few questions that we have in the Q&A. A number of people are asking about kind of what should we look for in terms of kind of the good um, or interpretations that challenge this kind of narcoist discourse um, idea. And some questions are geared towards kind of the um, identity of the person who creates the material itself. Like, do you think it matters um, whether this cultural production originates in the US or Mexico in terms of creating kind of content, especially when we're talking about cultural production around the drug war and narratives around the narco? Um, do you think that, um, or have you noticed a difference in terms of kind of uh, uh, production that is coming from Mexico. I know you provided some examples of um, the not so helpful uh, <laughs> production, but a lot of what you're saying is that kind of the narrative itself or that is being kind of followed is coming from the DEA and other kind of US uh, policing institutions. So I don't know if you can speak to that question. Right. Um, well, I think there are some um, different levels of how this uh, narrative works. Uh, on one hand, you have you know, the actual mediation uh, directly by agencies like the DEA, right? That, um, that you know, uh, manage, consult, uh, police, and, and even censor some of the content that, that you see in TV series and, 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 and especially in, in film, right? Um, and this happens voluntarily, right? Because uh, in, in many of these productions are brought in as consultants uh, to validate, you know, what what they're what we're about to see in, in 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 a series or in a film, and 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 this is a very interesting phenomenon, right? Because uh, the producers of these series trust that you know that official uh, institutions are the ones telling us the truth, right? And 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 the same happens, of course, as if uh, as as that same information traverses the media, right? Uh, and when people are writing a script or or imagining you know a a film or or, or an episode in a TV series, often they have. Um, to draw information from uh, media reports. But the same happens to, to journalism, right? Uh, in, in, in most of journalism, um, it is official institutions and official discourse that guides the reasoning and the understanding of the drug trade. Um, this is something that, by the way, I, I researched uh, in, in my recent book, uh, when I study the history of how the killing of uh, Agent Camarena in Guadalajara in 1985, has maintained pretty much the same narrative since the 1980s and on, right? And, and the, even the same people, the same agents that were working um, in, in that decade, um, not, not only trying to understand what happened, but, but also imposing the narrative on, on how to understand the crime are still to this day, right, mediating in that narrative. Um, so, uh, so you have that, that relationship first, right? The, the, rela the, the close relationship between uh, official institutions and, and those trying to narrate either from a perspective of journalism or from the, the fields of cultural production, these events. And then you have, of course, the effect of hegemony itself, right? I mean, just, just simply how this uh, discourse has taken on um, such a um, uh, powerful um, um, trend that becomes uh, conflated with reality, right? That uh, it comes to a point that in a, in a very spontaneous way, um, the writer of the script, uh, the actor, the director, the photographer, people promoting the film, and ultimately the audience uh, are expecting the same reality narrated and re-narrated, right? Um, and so um, uh, when, you, when you work against the grain of the hegemonic discourse, it almost feels sometimes that you're working against reality, right? And, and that um, when you're challenging this, this stories, uh, right? Uh, I'll, I'll, some people feel so uncomfortable because it seems almost as if, you know, you're the very ground in which you're standing is suddenly being shaken, right? Um, and, and so this is the effect, of course, of, of the narrative. And it's very difficult to, to overcome it precisely because of that. Now, uh, in, in, in my previous book and in this one, I do uh, try to emphasize that of course, uh, this is not a totalized imagination. It's not like a, it's an absolute way of looking at it, but rather it's a field of dispute, right? As, as the um, people studying the dimension of politics and language would tell you, right? Uh, 
that it's um that it's a place where the hegemonic narrative is being challenged over and over by different perspectives and different ways of imagining uh, the drug war. However, uh, the dominant trends of this narrative are the ones that prevail and that keep uh, being repeated over and over because they're the ones that are recognized by most of the audience, right? They're the ones that, are, that, that would be probably consumed and accepted by, by most people in the US or in, or in Latin America because again, they, they're conflated with the real, right? Yeah, I think that point is so important. And especially when we think about like how these narratives are perpetuated, like if like Hollywood has its own hegemony in terms of how things are produced, but also in terms of that, the production of that idea of what is real. And I think Mexico has its own hegemony in, in the region in terms of producing like telenovelas um, that like, you know, produce their own sure. particular ideas of what, of the real and, and garner quite a bit of um, popularity, like La Reina del Sur, no? Right. Um, so there's a question in the Q&A about the influence of narco corridos. Like oh. obviously um, there's a lot of debate about the extent, you know, what kind of effect they have on youths and, and on ideas about trafficking or potentially even perpetuating violence um, themselves. So, um, what is your perspective in terms of kind of the influence they have socially and or politically? Well, I mean, I, I do touch a lot on, on, on this topic in my, in my new book. Um, I focus on narco corridos in two different ways. I feel first that um, they must be understood not in, in the traditional um, um, perspective of cultural studies, right? Uh, we have learned from people doing cultural studies that corridos are often, you know, the spontaneous expression of local communities um, uh, experiencing uh, certain events, right? The, the tradition of corrido, of course, dates back to the end of the 19th century, right? Where these songs would um, make a, a, an inscription or and circulate certain information about historical events, right? Such as, for example, the, cor the corridos of the um, Mexican Revolution. But when you move to, um, to the narco corrido, the folk ballad on, about the narco, you have a very different situation. Uh, first, I argue that um, that these songs are the effect also of that same mediation, right? When you look at what the authors of the corridos themselves say about their creative process, it's very telling to, to hear them, for example, mention how their imagination, imagination is a received imaginary, right? They, they, they read newspaper articles, they read um, the same news stories uh, that we all are exposed to, and they uh, then proceed to form their own uh, fantasies about the drug trade, right? And, and one of the most famous corridos, for example, you just mentioned that one, um, um, uh, rather uh, a derivative of that one, La, uh, Contrabando y Traizón, which tells the story of Camelia La Tejana. It's a, it's a corrido from 1972, um, was uh, composed by, by uh, Angel uh, Gonzalez, who has said uh, at some point uh, in an interview that, you know, does he just simply imagine this woman, uh, uh, because he liked the name and, and he thought it would be a really interesting narrative. And as you mentioned, uh, in those in those decades, especially the 70s and 80s, the melodrama set forth by soap operas from Televisa was so dominant that a lot of these songs uh, were also dramatized in almost in a way of a telenovela, right? So you have uh, you know this woman who who is uh, betrayed by her lover, and she decides to kill him and, and run with the money after they they successfully uh, trafficked uh, uh, some marijuana to the United States. And this melodrama, right, uh, which is very typical of the 1970s and 80s, is suddenly reconfigured in the 1990s uh, with uh, the corridos that uh, now empower the trafficker. Right? And, and that show the trafficker at the very center of society. And one of those songs that I, that I analyze and extend is the, the song Jefe de Jefes, right? And boss of Bosses, right? That I mentioned briefly in, in, in my presentation. And this is a very interesting song and very different from uh, the convention of the corrido because uh, first and foremost, it's, it's told from the perspective of the trafficker. Instead of telling a story about a trafficker, this is a trafficker talking Right? a nameless trafficker, a trafficker that is never identified and uh, neither is his organization. And he talks about how he suddenly is in, in the center of power in society in Mexico. And this is a, a, an extraordinary change in that narrative. So something that I analyze in my book is precisely how we came about to that change, right? How is it that it happened that from the melodrama of the 70s and 80s uh, that resembled the soap operas of that era, we turn to this, you know, securitist, uh, you know, uh, alarmist idea of the trafficker now at the center of society, and and the only explanation that uh, that I that I could come to uh, in my research 
uh, and by you know going through the archives of the 1990s, is that you know that the the official discourse with, that that began circulating in the mid 90s definitely mediated in the imagination of, of the uh, of the corridos. So so something that I that I would like to argue then when when thinking of these songs is that a they're products right of the official imagination that is changing in the decades right that is moving um, from one imagination of the trafficker to another one. And then two, that, uh, that this imaginary affects everyone, you know, including the traffickers. And so I would not necessarily blame the song, right, for, for perhaps, you know, instigating that same imagination in, in the younger generations in Mexico, because it is that imagination that it's already circulating in all kinds of different cultural pro products, right? So if the, if the young um, Mexican um, class that it's living in precarious conditions that have the very little... Uh, options for their future suddenly believe right that trafficking is a way of life you know that would give them some form of success you know some form of you know place in society uh, well I think the song is at least to be blamed right it's it's an imaginary that has been circulating for so many decades that it's of course conflated with reality and with with a real option that the young uh, precarious uh, poor people don't have, right? Um, and so, um, so I would like to think then of, of that chain of representation, right? B going back to the official institutions, narrating the same story from the beginning. Right? right, yeah. And that actually leads into another question I wanted to ask you and which you opened this talk with, which is about like how narcos themselves participate. And right. it's a problem. It's it's a problem that, or not a problem, but kind of a difficulty I've had when like keeping up with this literature and thinking about it. Like, and um, because like you showed the example of the narco mantas and how they or the narco banners and how they participate in this idea that there's this really clear division between traffickers and the government. Us um, and them, right? Right, and um, like, but in some ways it seems to not necessarily benefit them in the sense that you're talking about, which is that it's reifying this idea of a drug war that has to be waged. Um, and I know like some narco banners try to contest like who's responsible for the violence, but in the end, they're still kind of reaffirming this clear dividing line. So can you talk a little bit more about how narcos participate in the reproduction of this idea? And also maybe, I don't know if you have any um, kind of hypotheses as to why that participation happens as it does? Well, I, I believe there's, um, there's something to be said about how discourse is performed by everyone in society uh, in different levels, right? Of course, we perform that, that discourse by experiencing this anxiety and this fear, right, uh, of the constant uh, narrative of a threat of, of you know, narcos about to take over uh, civil society. But traffickers, I believe, are not entirely different from, from that uh, same experience, right? Uh, but in their case, of course, they, they want to be closer to the mythology that is surrounding them, right? This is something, for example, that I, that I analyzed in my previous book, but I also mentioned in this one, in which uh, the traffickers sometimes, um, you know, come close to, uh, to performing uh, the myth because it, it inspires something that they are not. Right, it instigates an idea of you know success and 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 relevance that their lives are is not reflecting. Right, and and this is something that you could see, for example, in that um, very strange um, uh, encounter between actress Kate Del Castillo, actor Sean Penn, and and Chapo Guzman. Right, that uh, that was featured in Rolling Stone in that article that that he wrote. And then um, and, the subject of a absolutely bonkers documentary that she right. <laughs> <laughs> right and and it's really interesting right because as you know Kate del Castillo played uh the famous queen of the south in one of the soap operas um that was produced by Telemundo which by what the way was a very successful soap opera right uh, I think the final episode was one of the with the highest ratings ever for uh for any language um, in, in that year, I forget the, the year exactly what it was. I think it was 2016 or 2017. But in any case, um, uh, when they meet, right, oh, uh, Kate del Castillo and El Chapo, they're, they're all already mediated by discourse, right? They're, they're all seeing each other's myths, right? Uh, El Chapo's looking at the Queen of the South. She's looking at, uh, you know, the, the head of the Sinaloa cartel. And, and there's something to be said about the impossibility of thinking uh, beyond that, that discourse and the rules of enunciation of this discourse. And so when you move to the narcomantas, you know, to all these messages, the messages that I was uh, referring to that circulated in WhatsApp, it is very difficult to, 
to discern, you know, what is real and what is not. And maybe it's a combination of things, right? Maybe, maybe there was an original message in which, you know, a, a group of traffickers wanted to intimidate people in a certain city. And, and that got recirculated so many times that we lost the original, right? Maybe it was never true. It was, maybe it was never real. Um, but the same happens with the narcomantas, right? The, the violence is there, but then all these expressions of discourse that come to signify it, um, in a very interesting way, reproduce the same narrative, right? That, that is us versus them, right? The narcos are saying something to all of us, civil society. And that is something that, that I think um, is not, not just verifiable, but, it, but it's something that we can work with, right? Because that, that very artificial division between the criminal world, right? That it, we're led to believe is out there and us, you know, the, the normal society um, functions in a political way so effectively that ends up legitimizing, you know, the anti-drug militarization, right? The, the, the violence that we're experiencing that makes us in many ways look, af look over uh, state-sponsored violence or, or just blandly, you know, atrocities committed by the armed forces in different parts of Mexico. And so, um, so this narrative ultimately, um, it, it, gains its its power and its relevance in in the in the spontaneous acceptance of, of, of uh, that produces in all of us uh, including the traffickers right yeah absolutely um so I, I apologize if there's something it's just my children are out there and it's difficult to, <laughs> to um okay this is just silence my, the house my <laughs> um so yeah like i mentioned there's a, a lot of questions here and it's I'm trying to go through them as I'm listening to your very interesting responses, but um, there's one question I think would be interesting to hear you chat about, which is just how you arrived to the topic. Um, oh. And another person wants you to talk a little bit about your time as a journalist and was wondering sure. um, kind of, you know, your experience, if you had experience covering these types of topics. So yes. I don't know if the two are related. Or yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, and, and this is something I mentioned in both books, but I think I, I was able to introduce a little more of that experience in my new book, uh, In La Guerra en las Palabras. Um, I began as a journalist in 1990, 1995, uh, when I was 18 uh, years old, but I, but I began working in a, as, as a you know, full-time reporter in a newsroom in Ciudad Juarez in, in 96 when I was 19. And, and it was, I was, of course, a very imp impressionable young man, you know, trying to, to understand just the, the ropes on, uh, on journalism. But, but I was very lucky to have uh, uh, extraordinary mentors that educated me into thinking critically about the drug trade. And we, uh, in those years, in 86 in particular, we were living through this uh, strong campaign that was set forth by the FBI and the DA, pushing the idea that the Juarez cartel had become the dominant cartel in, in, in all of Latin America. Of course, uh, Pablo Escobar was dead, right? Um, you know, he was killed in, in, in Medellin. His organization was dismembered. And so the new organization or the only rather in organization that was still functioning at the level that the DA was telling us was the Juarez cartel. So uh, it was a very interesting moment because we were not reporting about it and suddenly we were flooded by um, um, uh, media reports, uh, by intelligence reports, by the FBI and the DEA pushing this idea, right? That, oh no, the Juarez cartel is a new threat. You know, Amado Carrillo Fuentes is trafficker, the Lord of the Skies is the new boogeyman. And, and it was very interesting because um, our city uh, was not going through any particular uh, wave of violence, as I mentioned, right? In fact, um, there was some, um, some uh, events uh, recorded by in previous years of shootings here and there, but uh, the amount of violence that we perceive now, of course, was nowhere to be seen. It was, it was a relatively peaceful uh, a city back, back then. Um, and so I, I, I was witnessing as a journalist how that you know, entire uh, perception of not just what is, but Mexico entirely changed in the next years. And so that my experience as a journalist was, was very useful uh, now that, I'm, that, I, that I became a scholar in, in, in writing and, and researching these topics, because it, it, it showed me how easily manipulative is the um, discourse and, and how it can very easily mediate in, in, in media representations of the drug war, um, including myself, right? As a, as a young journalist, I ended up reporting, you know, of course, that the Juarez cartel was uh, very all powerful and mighty, uh, with, that, with the exception that uh, we didn't use the word cartel uh, as often. I, I was told by, by my mentors, look, you know, the word cartel is not, is not something we could verify, 
Um, have you ever seen a cartel? I was like, no, like, I guess not. Well, I mean, this is something they say, but uh, unless we we somehow could verify it, we we try not to use it. And and that's you know when perhaps the 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 seminal idea of drug cartels do not exist exist uh, it started working in in my head, right? Of course, I was not entirely aware of all this. Um, uh, problems with the representation that we were going through in, in the newsroom, but it became clear that um, that we were, um, of course, uh, led by uh, official discourse into thinking and reporting the phenomena um, in the way that the, these agencies were telling us. Um, and so um, it is no surprise, right, that if you move forward um, in, in, in the media coverage of those years, to, to uh, Felipe Calderón's beginning of the war on drugs in 2006, um, that narrative has only radicalized, right? And, and has become even more dominant and more accepted widely in Mexico. But in those years in the 90s, as, as it was first introduced, there was still resistance and confusion rather from, from many of us uh, reporters on the streets, right? Because we were being told of, a, of an experience of violence that were not exactly that was not exactly verifiable, and that we we were not really perceiving the way discourse was telling us. Yeah, that's fascinating. And as you were talking, it made me think back to the like incredibly disturbing image you showed of the um, DEA museum and the mask of Pablo <laughs> Escobar. I've By the way, it's supposed to be a real mask based on his face that that they somebody that he lent himself, you know, to to produce this model, right, of the mask. <laughs> yeah, but it seems like part of the these policing organizations' obsession with the individual people at the top, which obviously reinforces the kingpin right. strategy, right? right? Where it's like it's all about you know the kingpin or this one guy who once we take him down the whole, you know, system. yeah, this cult of personality, right? That um that creates this 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 you know dark celebrities that we must at the same time feel attracted to and and you know abominate right and 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 so this is perhaps one of the biggest contradictions of of the official discourse in the directory because it creates these fascinating characters that you know fit perfectly in a tv series but at the same time of course they're designed to produce and instigate this fear right so this is a fear that both entertain us and disgust us right and and we have to deal with both emotions and in and in that you know bipolar um, I guess emotional train right that that we experience through this course we end up accepting and assimilating right the the legitimacy of the anti drug policy in the region. Yeah, it's it really interesting to me too that this is part of like uh, a propaganda for the institutions themselves sure. as well. Um, like you mentioned with Sedena, only being open to to or internally right. Um, and this is something really interesting, right? Because those two museums, right, uh, coexist and, and but but have very different functions, right? And and the Mexican Museum of Drugs was created in 1985, you know, right after uh, the killing of Enrique Camarena, and they say that openly, right? That after in the wake of the killing of the DEA agent, they needed an instrument for uh, indoctrination, basically, but not of the people, but of the soldiers that were being uh, led into the the drug war. Right? And so when you walk into the museum, you have literally a narrative of how drugs are you know, the, the biggest danger in Mexico and the history of you know, the drug trade in Mexico, but also you have these artifacts that have been taken from drug seizures you know, all over uh, the region, including of course, a big section on the weapons used by the traffickers, uh, among them, the very gun that El Chapo Guzman uh, held and that was used to convict them in the trial in New York. So, so it's, it's a very interesting place, right? Because it, it's almost as a place of worship, right? Uh, for, for the national security discourse. There's these it's artifacts. Like, it's creating new heroes of war too, yeah. I think. I, I know from the DA um, museum and their exhibits, like they have a wall of fallen martyrs and things sure. like that. It's like uh, using the same language of like- and, a and They have the similar wall and the Mexican museum okay. um, uh, right outside the museum seem as you enter. Oh, very interesting. Um, <laughs> so we have uh, only 12 minutes left and lots of questions, but I think there are a number of people asking her um, kind of in a, a share, this idea you mentioned of a shared future and different ways of kind of challenging this do dominant hegemonic narrative. Um, some one person asked us in like our day-to-day -day lives as students, um, I think you've pointed us to some examples of um, at least cultural production that challenged this narrative. But do you have um, ideas for whether it's possible to challenge this 
hegemonic narrative at all, or if so, how? Well, uh, you know, now that we're talking about museums, I, I could um, add a little bit to that discussion in, in that sense. At the, at the very end of my new book, I, I have a, uh, a section where I reflect on, on this very question. And, and one of the, uh, the things that I suggest is perhaps the possibility of creating a, a counter narrative institutionalizing a new museum, right? And, and I call this the Museum of National Security. <laughs> and, and the idea would be, of course, that we memorialize all these narratives and its objects, right? That, that we have uh, created or have been created in the decades of the drug war. But not only those, but also the other artifacts surrounding the other enemies of national security, right? Global communism, um, the terrorist, uh, the undocumented migrant that becomes a bad hombre, all, all those objects and enemies crafted by, by the imagination of the national security platform. So, so one of the things that I suggest in the end is that the problem is not just drugs, and the question of legalization or, or how to deal with this uh, so-called cartels, but rather how to distance ourselves from uh, this permanent campaign of militarization that is uh, um, appropriated and, and deployed uh, over a multitude of enemies that are continually being appearing you know, or make up, made appear in, in the horizon of, of politics in, in Mexico and the US. And so we need to switch the agenda, right? We need to, we need to completely re reconsider how is it that we came to really believe in the question of national security and, and completely push it away. But it's very difficult, of course, because security in itself, you know, it's already a field of study, right? There's people studying, of course, as you know, in you know, international relations, you know, there's, there's a big field of, you know, uh, security studies all over uh, the Western world. And, and how to deal with, how to understand policies of national security. So a country, countries in the global south, and, and this is something that I argue in the end, they need to uh, create their own, um, I guess, policy, not of security necessarily, but of, of pacification, right? And meaning uh, transforming completely that platform, turn it upside down and start talking about not how to, you know, increment uh, the armed forces or the security apparatus in, in a given situation, but how to de-escalate, right? The militarization, how to bring other uh, options to, to not just peace, but also, you know, um, uh, re re rebuild society from the start almost, right? Because in many places in Mexico where the militarization has gone through, you know, social tissue is so devastated. Uh, uh, the young uh, generations are, are so out of options that, um, that it's very difficult to think in, in other terms that are not, you know, crime and, and, and gangs and, and, and militaries and uh, soldiers and police officers, you know, harassing them. So, uh, so at the end, you know, this idea of, of a new museum that, that, all, that in a way cancels or short circuits, you know, the, the Mexican drug museum or the DEA museum, it seems to me like, a, like an important tool, right? To, to, make, um, to, make, a, to make way and, and, and open a, a debate, a national debate, uh, uh, as, as something that has already been memorialized. I'm thinking here also of the 1968 museum that was open uh, not, not long ago in Mexico City to rethink and to memorialize you know, the excesses of, of state violence uh, deployed against uh, the student movements in the 1960s and 70s. So maybe we can do the same thing about the drug war, right? And, and memorialize and, and reflect as, together as a nation uh, of an era that we need to cancel by, in, in many ways by putting it in the museum, right? Absolutely. I, I really like that idea of creating kind of narratives and um, kind of policies of pacification rather than kind of trying to modify the, the drug war itself. Right, right. Um, let's see uh, what other questions we have uh, before we, we close. Um, so here's uh, kind of, I guess this will be our final question. Um, do you see the rise of in economic nationalism and assertion of sovereignty over strategic resources as a possible divergent moment for the official US-Mexico security narrative of the narco war? That is, uh, the Americans doubled down on this narrative and conflate sovereignty with criminality and authoritarianism while the Mexicans pull back from this narrative in the interest of pursuing a more neutral path in the new multipolar war. Um, and Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, the, person knows <laughs> the Texan political community establishment seems especially intent on inflating the narco threat in energy rich resource areas. Absolutely. I mean, that, that'll, that's almost already a paper in itself. Um, 
Uh, no, absolutely, I agree with all that. Um, this is something that I that I discuss in, in my in my recent book as well. I believe that um, um, a part of what's going on right now in Mexico is is that very dispute between two narratives, right? That uh, on one hand, you know, the idea of uh, retelling rehash then the narco war uh, through, you know, the new bicentennial agreement, right, that replaced the Merida initiative and that we deploys, you know, money and, 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 and training for, for soldiers and police officers in the so-called drug war. Um, uh, but on the other hand, you know, as President Lopez Obrador has, was trying to set on the agenda, there's a complete um, uh, retake on and reconsider consideration of uh, energy sovereignty, right? And the question of uh, uh, resources, energy, oil, uh, gas, uh, minerals, et cetera, uh, as the real dispute uh, over the future of Mexico. You know, one of the things, the key things he's been trying to do, for example, is to um, stop uh, and prevent the the, uh, the illegal extraction of uh, oil from the naval bases of, of, of Pemex, right? The, the oil, uh, the paraestatal uh, para Pemex, right? The, the state-owned company uh, that that, uh, that circulates the petroleum in Mexico. And, and by doing so, of course, they're re reconsidering all the energy contracts. And there's a big debate even uh, on the opening of a new refinery, right? Um, uh, which would be number seven um, uh, in, in Mexico, which is an extraordinary thing, right? To think that Mexico is a producer of oil and it only has six refineries, whereas in the US there's uh, above uh, 130, right? And, and that dispute itself, I think it's, it's in part uh, what is at stake in these two competing narratives. And, and so it is a very different, very difficult thing to, to reconcile, however, for two reasons. First, because we have, um, we're used to thinking energy and security as two separate realms of discussion and debate, right? We, we tend to think that security is a matter of drug cartels, you know, criminals and armed gangs, et cetera. And, and that energy is a question of for, for political uh, debate, for diplomacy, for, for international agreements, et cetera. But I believe that uh, we need to bring those two uh, discussions together, right? And, and to consider how, for example, in, in the years previous to this administration, especially in, in, in the government of Enrique Peña Nieto, we had those two processes helping each other, right? As, as the US was pushing for energy reform in 2013, they were also arming our military, right? Arming, uh, militarizing our police, pushing for the drug war, right? And, and, and supporting the two presidents that unleash this militarization, right? They call uh, President Obama uh, back in the day called President Calderon a hero, you know, uh, of the Mexican people for you know unleashing the war that caused 121 um, homo uh, thousand homicides and more than 30 thousand disappearances. And the same happened again with Enrique Peña Nieto. No, that, that at some point he was called the, the hero saving Mexico, as you may remember from that infamous uh, Time magazine cover, right? That placed him on the cover, uh, celebrating him as as the savior of Mexico. So yes, I believe those two um, uh, aspects of, of Mexico's future need to be brought together in under the same discussion and, and to understand the political nuance of those two narratives competing. Right? Great, well, thank you so much, Lizaldo. This was so fascinating. And I think I speak for all of us um, in saying that we really appreciate you joining us in this virtual space to discuss your new work. Um, and hopefully we'll, get you in person to Seattle at some point. Thank you uh, so much. And I, I noticed that somebody was uh, uh, asking for uh, the, um, uh, the the copies of uh, the previous copies of the Los Carteles No Existen. I think it's right now out of print. There, there's a new uh, edition coming uh, coming through, but the English version is, is about to be released, I think in the next week or two. So you can order it uh, through Amazon if, if, you, if you would like to read it. Or directly through Vanderbilt University Press. Through Vanderbilt, yes. Um, um, and yeah, I'm sure pre-orders can can happen as of now. So don't yes. worry about the the shameless plugging of your book. <laughs> <laughs> the, the people are demanding more more information. So thank, thank you. you, Oswaldo. Hope you have a wonderful evening. And thank you so much. And and thank you for everyone listening. Yes, thanks everyone for joining us today. And um, I'll just plug our last of our, the events that we have coming up in this series on narco wars and narratives. As Osvaldo alluded to, um, my colleague Tony Lucero and I are gonna be doing a Q&A with uh, the executive producer of Narcos tomorrow morning, bright and early at 9 a.m. Um, so we'd love to have you join us for that. Uh, next week, Adela Cedillo of University of Houston will be joining us um, for a talk and Q&A to follow. So you can find all that information on the UW LAX page and we hope to see you there.
Buenas noches. Thank you. Buenas noches. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Gracias a ti. Bye. Bye bye.